<laughs> I think we are already online streaming to YouTube, so we can immediately start with the show if you are up to. Of course, of course. How are you and where are you at the moment? Well, I'm in London and we are a bit prisoners here, you understand, right? But it happily, it is one of our preferred, uh, we love this place that we have here. So everything is perfect, actually. It's very fine. Very empty streets, very, very empty streets. So that's quite striking. Yeah, place to hear that you are both fine. Uh, I'm also fine, although the streets are empty and it's like, what, two weeks of self-isolation for now already. So it's kind of switching day and night and Actually, I realized I work even more than usually. I'm online like 14 hours a day uh, because of the self-isolation, yeah. And are you, are you in your home or are you, did you wind up when it all happened in some place that... <laughs> I'm stuck in one European city. I didn't succeed to go back to, to Croatia. So who knows, it's, everything is uncertain, but it could be much worse. I mean, people who are without a home or without a job, so... Right. Yeah, so let us start. Let me just uh, uh, say hello to everyone who is watching us today in the world after coronavirus. I'm really honored. Uh, me too, I say hello. <laughs> sure. I'm really honored that we have Saskia Sassen today, uh, acclaimed soci sociologist, uh, author of plenty of books. Uh, uh, she coined the term Global City, which was also the name of her influential book from 1991. In the meantime, she published many other books, most recently, Expulsions, Expulsions, oh my God, I cannot even pronounce it because I'm from the Balkans, I'm sorry. <laughs> but that's a great book, which is also dealing with some of the topics we will uh, investigate uh, tonight. I'm really glad that you joined. Uh, the format of to, tonight's uh, uh, event is the following one. Uh, you will have a short introduction of uh, 15 minutes. Uh, on the possibilities of coronavirus and then afterwards uh, I will join in in a conversation and at the same time I will also look at the YouTube chat to collect the questions of our audience. Uh, so the floor is yours and uh, you take your time and thanks a lot again for joining us. I know many people are excited. Well, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here and again Treko, you always have good projects. I would have a very difficult time saying no to you <laughs> on any project you do. But anyhow, so, so coming to the subject at hand, the current moment, uh, I don't know if you had already planned this series before we were hit by this. So, so it, it just coincides. So I would think that you find that a rather interesting coincidence or not? Can you answer? Mm -hmm. Well, to be honest, we, 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 we didn't plan anything. Uh, it came out- <laughs> didn't plan all of that, right? Yeah, it came out of utter helplessness, to be honest. Uh, in a moment of self-isolation, we were actually discussing how do we feel and how do many other people feel? And that in the absence of the public events, which we were doing, I mean, you and me, we joined many stages from Zagreb to Berlin, uh, that we need to recreate this kind of online public space where we could share our opinions and analysis of the situation. Yeah, yeah I see, I see. Because really there, there is a, there is, to me, this is not simply a virus. To me, this is a call for us to be on alert. Something foundational has happened, it's partial, but it's quite foundational in that it really reduces the weight of power. Power can go only so far. We know that the powerful will do better than the poor in this crisis, but at the same time, the powerful are also getting hit. And I think for many, I don't need that type of element, you know, to understand. But I think that in general, it is sort of a, a bit of an alert to people that, aha, uh -huh, this is not just us, the disadvantaged, us, the poor, because remember, that's the majority in our world. This is something else that is also happening. Now, I don't want to talk the whole time about this, huh? but I do find uh, this coronavirus uh, event, 
a telling event. You know, it enters the picture at a moment when we already had quite a few unsettlements. You know, things were not quite uh, easy the, the way they had been, et cetera, et cetera. Now, second point, we in the West have really messed up with a lot of our initiatives. And the question of climate change, I'm just going to speak in shorthand because these are all familiar subjects. But the question of, of climate change, which many of the young generations are really, you know, gathering around, uh, that we elders have never taken very seriously. You know, we are also pulled in now because we realize something has changed. And one way of thinking about that something that has changed is that we have crossed the limits of a system. In other words, we're a bit on the other side. One foot, we have stepped out and it's just a bit too much. You know, we are dealing with systematicities that can't quite fully digest, fully narrate, uh, themselves, you know, and whether that's people or events. And I think that I want to take that seriously, you know, that this is no longer just us, the people. Yes, we need to eat. Yes, we need, uh, you know, shelter. Yes, we need uh, to be with other people and all of that. Uh, we have needs. They're not going away. But there is something else in play. And one way of putting it is it's an invitation for us to sort of sit down and think a bit, what the hell is this? And this invisible, without smell, without sound, <laughs> microbe uh, invites us to do that. You know, it sort of is a call for attention to things that we hadn't thought about because we are confronted continuously with big things, big sounds, big initiatives, and here is this invisible, of course, vast quantities, evidently, uh, that is, you know, creating a new landscape as it moves and as we stop moving because we are sitting in our homes mostly. And so it is navigating across all the barriers that we have, the necessity for passport controls, None of that. It navigates at another level. Now, it's not that I'm enamored or intrigued or that there is too much to be said about this micro. But what is interesting for me is to capture that side of it. It can navigate above all that we have done. It has its own modalities, its own capabilities. It doesn't ask anything for us every now and then, maybe a bit of blood or whatever it is that it eats. But it is quite, it is not stopping by and saying, you know what, if you don't behave better, we are going to do this. No, it doesn't need to. It doesn't need to threaten us. You know, it is powerful in its own way. And, and so, you know, I'm just, I mean, I wish I were a poet because with, as a poet, you could sort of construct a figure huh? uh, that we right now don't have. You know, we, we, we don't have a, we don't have a name for it. Of course, we have a name for it, but you know what I mean? So how can this play a role, you know, in all kinds of conditions that we confront? Because it can enter anything. Our houses, our noses, everything. We can't. And so we have to think about this. Now we have had such things before. This is not the first time, but this is the grandest time, I think. In the past, it was not as grand as this. Now that tells us the second element, which is the fluidity in the world. This is not about, uh, I'm not trying to invoke internationalism or globalism, no, just the navigational aspect of diseases, of, of storms, you know, it's not just this particular uh, item. So to me, there is a tale to be produced collectively, you know, by, by many of us that says, okay, what can we learn from this? Because we have to, we can't just talk about the microbe itself. I mean, you know, it is that, it is what it is. It can hit us or pass us by, whatever. But what, what tale, you know, if we were elders of another epoch, another time and place, 
we would narrate this. We would say these are the gods who blah, 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 right? And so I'm sort of intrigued by that part, but that's only one part of what we want to talk, right? <laughs> so, so I don't know if you have questions for me or... As you wish, I have plenty of questions, but I think the best is that you continue your line of thought and then I'm, I'm noting the questions down and then we start maybe. Okay, because I find it really interesting just to, to hear you speaking, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so that is one, one point, eh? this particular moment. And this is a moment that will pass, but we don't want to forget it, I think, because this, what is interesting is the extent to which it has affected everybody, all more or less major areas of the world. There is something particular and it's not the American army, eh? right? That has also entered in many parts of the world. This is something else. So I do think that that, that that is sort of a, that's an interesting, you know, and I'm sure that poets will write things about it that will be inspiring, that will signal, that will alert us to something, et cetera, et cetera. The second element, much more sort of pedestrian, you know, not, not as elusive as this particular one is. Uh, the second issue is how we have constructed our economies and that which protects us, that which gives us food, that which, et cetera, et cetera. And the capacities that are involved in that. And then at the same time, so many hungry people in the world, so many destroyed you know, villages where they knew how to grow their food, et cetera, destroyed either for modernization issues or because they did plantations or because they, they started some mining operation, but we have destroyed, destroyed, destroyed across the world, instantiations of something productive and helpful that local people who knew that land, who knew those plants, who knew when the water comes, when the water stops, who knew how to grow all of that. We have just entered with plantation formats, with mining, etc., and we have eliminated a vast amount of knowledges about local conditions, very local conditions. But in the end, our big world is a collection of localities and we need the local knowledges and we're losing them. And so to me, that is a second sort of major issue that inevitably I think about when, I, when I'm talking about the, this virus. I see this virus as sort of, a, <laughs> I can imagine a play where this virus is, you know, a signal. It's, it's not simply a negative. It's not. I don't want to, it's not the enemy. We are the enemy, maybe. You know, we humans, the way we have treated things, etc. cetera. Uh, now, let's see. So moving away from some of these issues, you know, that are of very much of the moment of this particular, uh, what is happening, and we're all sort of a bit engaged by that and going to more, more pedestrian, more familiar uh, things, uh, some, of the, some of the subjects, some of the issues that I'm interested in right now. One of them is, you know, I stand back and I say, how is it possible that with all the mobilizations that have happened, you know, across a century and more, of course, they've started also, but uh, for getting a bit more social justice, just a bit more, how difficult that is, how difficult it is to get a bit of social justice for those who have been disadvantaged, treated improperly, abused, never enabled, those who are suffering, et cetera, et cetera, you know, which is probably half of the world's population, if not more. You know, I'm not sure of that. I'm now I'm going to, I'm going to check it out when we're done because I would like to Oh, uh, but I think a good half of the world of this, now we're talking humans, we humans, uh, is really, uh, has had a very hard time. We have let them suffer. We have not really done what we could have done, et cetera, et cetera. So to me, this is a major issue. And I don't see right now any types of interventions besides those types of groups that have for a very long time been enabling 
uh, you know, very poor communities. You know, you have many, many people who are doing that, but it's not enough to really change uh, the system sufficiently that, that you know, uh, that we can avoid the miseries that we're still seeing. I mean, we see terrible miseries uh, in the world. Uh, so, so what is it? We have the knowledge, we have the capabilities, we have the machines, we have the, the in a way, the, the elements to produce the food that is needed to, but we're not getting there. And so the question is, why? And I am not thinking of one big actor who can solve it all. I am thinking of multiple, multiple, multiple localities. And in a way, that's where much of Europe, not all of Europe, but much of Europe has a bit of that. It has localized its economic production, its food production. You know, there is more lo localizing rather than having, like we here in the United States, I'm not now in the United States, ever in, in general, we get our food sometimes from like from Australia. Is that really necessary? No. Who gains? The operators. We the people don't need that. When, when can we really straighten out, huh? straighten out the way we handle food production, food distribution, uh, not to mention the packaging and all of that. There is a lot of work to be done. We need to find, you know, what, what Germany does so well, and I think all these all these European countries do so well. Little gardens where you can, you know, you can grow a bit of food, etc. Now I remember some friends of mine in Manhattan, living in Manhattan, uh, decided, well, we can do a garden, but we can have chicken, and so they brought chicken into luxury apartments. That didn't work very well either. But you know, in a way, we should find a way of localizing more. I, I'm not saying, I, you know, I'm, I'm mentioning now very simple examples where we could do some of that, but there are more complex versions of that. You know, how do we sort of relocalize what now has been internationalized in ways, however, that they don't, it's not their national internationalism that makes that food work. No, it's the fact that we have access to it. Well, to have access to it, we don't need to have these huge productions that really benefit only certain types of actors, right? Um, what else? Do you have any questions for me? Because, you know, I can just go on talking about things that I think matter, but, you know, do you have? Sure, sure. Yes. Uh, let me jump in immediately yes. by, by, by a question. And I can see we have already plenty of questions of people watching us. Uh, so let me first a comment and a question. I, I really loved how poetically you framed at the beginning uh, uh, your perspective. And I, I fully agree with my heart uh, uh, that we need some sort of poetry to understand it because it obviously goes beyond our understanding and anything we, we actually experience. Uh, uh, you, you mentioned um, several times, you mentioned, you stressed the perspective of understanding a system, a systematic change. Mm -hmm. And you also said that uh, this is not for the first time uh, that humanity, although for us, us who are living now, the contemporaries uh, of 2020, this is certainly the first time we are in this kind of global situation, uh, mm -hmm. but, uh, during history, we had examples when different diseases, I mean, from the Black Death in the 14th century to the Spanish flu in the early 20th century, uh, diseases came. Uh, they were also using the global infrastructure network. Uh, I mean, the, the plague was using the Silk Road, uh, the Spanish flu was using uh, the, the army which was returning from, from the war and so on. Uh, but also what, what these historical events show is how they left very deep consequences. And in some cases, it could be even claimed that the Black Death also led to the destruction of feudalism. Uh, so my question is, how do you see the current situation is it going to reinforce an even worse version of global capitalism, uh, or is it going to lead to, to, to a deeper change which would lead into a world which you outlined, you know, with more localized food, with more empathy, solidarity, quality, and so on. So how do you see it at this moment? So here's my take, and it could be, it's a bit of a, a, a desire, okay? So I don't know that it can happen, but many people who may have been 
very impressed and respectful and wanted more capitalism may actually say, maybe I should rethink this a bit, you know, because if this is what capitalism also enables, uh, then, uh, you know, I, I'm not so sure that I want this. In other words, is there something to be learned for us that is an opening of a possibility, an option emerges that we have learned something about this capitalism that we maybe hadn't quite understood. And that is on the one hand, how destructive it can be in a way that hits bodies, the bodies of old people, the bodies of young people, the bodies of innocent people, I'm sure also the bodies of some crooks, you know, but let's just say, in other words, this notion to me, it's like, I mean, I'm not at all religious, I must tell you, so I, but this event, I sort of, one way of interpreting it is not to bring in the religious, but to bring in images and possibilities which are not part of daily life. And in that sense, it could only be a kind of religion, you know, but it's not about religion in that sense. And that is that we are confronting something that we were not ready for. Now, supposedly we have all these machines, all these capabilities, all these brilliant people, et cetera, et cetera. But the virus, invisible, without smell, won. The victory was the victory of the virus, of that particular virus. And so that tells us a couple of things. One is that with all the stuff we have done for ourselves, in our also often selfishness, eh? that we want to have this and we want to have that and et cetera. And, well, and we, yes, we will buy that and we will buy that, et cetera, that somehow we forgot something. I don't know what the name is. I haven't quite thought out. What is the name of the virus? I don't mean what is the, the virus as, a, as an actor, not the virus as a virus. Eh? What, has it what is it representing in our daily life? Because we can call it the virus, but it is an actor in our lives. And that is different from simply being a virus. Yes, it is a virus, but it also has functioned. And maybe if it would have come 300 years ago, it wouldn't have functioned this way. But in our current modernity, it has functioned in a very particular way. We have to hide from it. We have to withdraw from it. We have to kill it. We have, you know, that's a very particular mode. Secondly, in the whole world, it's not just in one place. It's not just in one ugly capitalist country. It's all over. I don't know if all over might be an exaggeration, but you know what I mean? It's really in a lot of places. And it is simply the superior actor. We are not. It is. And when you see how people also then begin to, you know, good people begin to take care of, of others, you can already see, this is a kind of, you know, as the old Greeks might say, it's a new type of God. A good, I don't mean God as somebody that has all the powers, but I mean, a God in the sense of a capability, you know, to alter. I mean, it is teaching us something. That is what I want to get from this, that I want to get at, is that it is teaching us and it is enabling us to recognize our flaws, our, the, the poverty of our endeavors, you know, of what we really want to change, how we change it, et cetera. It just, it's a sort of a, 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 an alert. Huh? Now, I am sitting here very comfortable in my, lovely place here in London. It's very easy, and I still haven't been affected. <laughs> it's very easy for me to talk that way. And I don't mean to offend anybody by, I don't want to be sort of make it easy. But I do think that there is a version of this. Uh, I'm sure there are many versions that will emerge that are narrations of this event that are not simply about the narrow meaning of this uh, virus, but they will be narrative, like we have historically had in our past, 
narratives. They, these were gods that taught us something, supposedly. They were good gods or bad gods. Both were. And so here, when you think about it, this, this is speech. This is a kind of speech. It is alerting us to something. We can choose to say, ah, 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 as some kids did in, 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 uh, in, in Italy, as some kids did in, those are the two big examples in Spain, and now they are dead, those kids, right? So we've got to take it seriously. You know, we cannot just say, ah, well, this, you know, we can't. Now, what, I, I can imagine that a collective project comes out of that, which is what, how, if, if this virus would have encountered a different mode of our daily life, of how we build, of how we extract the food that we need, etc., uh, would it have conducted, would it have had a different impact on us if we would have done, diff if we had dealt with Mother Earth, I don't want to be too romantic here, huh? but if we would have dealt with Mother Earth, differently than we have. Would this virus also have been different? Because we were different, you know, these are these are speculative elements, they are ways of constructing a possible mode of sort of finding a version, you know, our version, like the like the old Greeks did and the old Romans, you know, had versions of their own histories. Yeah? I don't want to simply say, oh, you know that bug that killed so many people? No, I don't want that. Yeah, that bug did kill so many people. But I want a narrative coming out of this, a narrative that signals something. And it's a, it's a good moment for it to be a possible narrative because we have destroyed a lot and because this virus is destroying a lot too. I mean, there's destruction involved, death mostly in the form of bodies that die. And so we can take it seriously. We don't need to feel silly uh, by talking about these things. This is serious stuff. This many people killed and they didn't know that they were going to get killed. They didn't see it coming. You know, that, it sort of puts us on alert a bit. You yes, I think I, I think the, the 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 most uncanny perspective of this tiny organism, which is an RNA actually, uh, is precisely this fact that it's asymptomatic. That you can have it, but you don't know whether you have it. You can have it, you can spread it to someone. You don't know whether you have spread it, and it actually challenge challenges you to completely redefine not only your daily life but also the future. Uh, so you were mentioning narratives. I think this is really important. Uh, uh, I mean, I'm still struggling a small digression with the fact that there are not so many narratives about the Spanish flu, for instance, unlike the Black Death. Uh, like there are not so many literature uh, uh, books, uh, yes. uh, fictional books about right, the Spanish right. flu. Yes, yeah. I don't know whether you encountered that, not in the, the same amount as, uh, as the Black Death. Always very interesting that, I don't know, Walter Benjamin, uh, Franz Kafka, many famous uh, uh, historical figures, philosophers, writers, were affected by the Spanish flu, but they didn't write so much about it. Uh, that's interesting. I mean, of course, you could go to Thomas Mann and so on and find it, but I don't think that the Spanish flu, unlike today, I think what you can see is that, uh, you know, everyone is actually writing about it. Everyone has his or her own narrative about it, which is not necessarily bad. But my question then is, how can we create uh, a more positive, progressive uh, uh, narrative, which would at the same time be very localized in the sense that you have uh, even micro-local solidarity, you know, helping the elder people, going to the supermarket for them, uh, uh, re rearranging your daily life, but at the same time that it could be also internationalist in the sense of more transnational cooperation, which wouldn't be this kind of Trumpian language, you know, the virus is the enemy, that it's a Chinese virus and so on, because obviously you can see that there is all, all already a narrative being shaped by the, a, a hegemonic narrative being shaped, uh, which is not really admitting that uh, uh, the political economy, the way we build cities, the way we 
uh, treat the public sector, healthcare, and so on, they're not admitting that they failed utterly in that. And that, as you said, if we speculate, if we were able to build a different world before, maybe the virus wouldn't come or it would react differently or not so many people would uh, end up in, in, in emergency. Uh, so how do you see that? You know, are we able to still shape the narrative? I mean, I obviously believe we are. That's a rhetorical question. That's why we are doing this conversation. Sure. Yeah, yeah. To shape the narrative. But what I can see is that the other side, to put it like that, those who brought the planet into, into the ruins uh, uh, and, you know, climate crisis, and, and, and all these threats, those are now working very hard also to prevent a more progressive, positive narrative. Exactly. And, and um, what's happening in the United States with Trump is a very good example. I mean, it's absolutely unacceptable what, uh, what he's trying to do, but I don't want to talk about that. But you see, so, so, so here, are, here are a whole series of people, experts, who are working very hard to keep this virus under control, to rescue people, et cetera, et cetera. And then they find out that there aren't enough masks, face masks. And they found out that there aren't enough, you know, a whole series of little things that are not grand, you know, elements, grand, very, very simple. We don't have enough. Now, that then mobilizes all kinds of people, including nice grandmas, you know, who start doing these things. That, that is, one could almost say, that is sort of an indicator of our arrogance. We never even considered that that would be important or necessary. It's just a little mask, nothing, right? And so there are these little lessons and that we depended on Japan and on South Korea to get more masks because the United States, God forbid, they didn't have much, you know, certainly not enough and, and England didn't. So, you know, there are these, these juxtapositions of powerful actors, powerful situations, including hospitals. And I'm not just thinking about governments. Huh? And then there were the little thingies <laughs> that these very powerful countries didn't have because they hadn't even considered that something like that could happen. But they had them in Japan and they had them, you know. And so when you bring together all, there's a whole variety of the, you know, these juxtapositions that, are, that have a kind of irony about them. If you bring them all together, you stand back and you say, you know, how could we miss, like I'm not thinking of we the West, how could we miss so many little things? You know, what is in the culture? that doesn't see the little things. Now you can of course explain, well, you know, that nobody saw the, the crisis coming, et cetera. But the, the little fact itself, we didn't have enough masks. Oh, we had enough killer drugs and all of that, but we didn't have enough little masks. You know, there is something about that that you just want to play with. You just want to create a bit of a drama on the masks, the face masks I'm talking about. Yeah. And, and so, you know, I'm, I'm exaggerating a bit, but that's like an image, you know, that is an image. And another, to me, extremely powerful image is, uh, is confinement. Confinement is not going to secure security, but it certainly is safer than being out there on the street where you can't see it, you can't smell it, but the virus might just be there, right? And so it's like a return to, to elements, you know? Elements, as in the elements, you know? So we thought that these are things that we would never have called them elements. Now we stand back and you say, you know what? In this context, masks, they are an element. You know, an element in the sense that something that has standing, if you want, vis-a-vis -a, -vis a profession or, you know, a mask, a little mask that grandmas can sew, that is an element that has standing, you know, in a profession. We never thought of that. Well, that is what has happened. So you have grandmas sewing all of these things and they're actually, some of them are not workable, that's admitted. <laughs> but 
that was part of the rescue operation, right? And so it's like an invitation. I mean, what this virus has, it really makes you work very hard, even if you don't, we're not affected by it, because you, it invites you to think about all these little things that we just have taken for granted that we don't think, what my, of course, mask, anybody can get masks. No, the United States did not have enough masks. They needed China, they needed Japan, well, in this case, Japan and Seoul, right? And, you know, you, we just, I want to register those, those elements. I think they tell a tale, you know, it's a certain type of, I mean, this is like element number five, eh, what I'm talking about now, but it is very interesting. It's interesting the extent to which, you know, really working, uh, working societies, you know, working in the sense that they are more or less functional, it doesn't, none, none is perfect. The things that they didn't have, the things that they simply had not bothered to make sure that at least one factory in their country or in their neighborhood or in, the, in a part of a country uh, was secure to make those things. We just assumed we will never need that. This little virus that we cannot see and cannot smell has mobilized more materialities that we had forgotten about, like, like the mask, I'm now thinking of one example of a materiality. And suddenly we realized all the materialities we don't have. You know, and to me, so, you know, if I believed in gods, I would say, like the Greeks would have, <clears throat> you know what, the gods got angry with us. They had it with us. They were going to give us a lesson of all the things that we take for granted or don't even see or don't notice or don't recognize the people who make them or, or that we might need them, etc. cetera. And, um, you know, and there we are. I think I just love that image, you know, that the old gods uh, are in play here. And so I want to see these little, this invisible, these battalions of invisible viruses. <laughs> uh, I just wonder what's next. That's a good question. It's a good question. And I can also see that we got some questions already. So let me pose a question from someone from the audience, which actually really tackles uh, uh, what you just said. Uh, so a step forward would, would be, that's the question, how do we capture all of the knowledges produced, especially online, and transform it into something tangible? Well, that is clearly a, a collective project in the sense of multiple collectivities. So it cannot just be one collectivity. Because that's where we are right now. We think we know more or less what we need to know. We have to recognize that there are so many knowledges, including the knowledges that are still in Africa and in parts of Asia, you know, which are a very different kind of knowledge from our Western knowledge. So this question of our knowledges, what we have lost because we have replaced it with our current, and some of our current knowledges are critical to us and they are, they are very well done, etc. But I think also we have destroyed older knowledges. Uh, I grew up in Latin America, as you know, and, and there, the older, when I was a little girl, huh, uh, the older grandmothers had knowledges that my parents already didn't have. You know, they were already too modernized, so to say, even though they were older. I mean, these are all familiar issues. But, and say, I, I always think that some countries in Europe, maybe your country has that too, they are very good when you go to a pharmacy, they have all of these natural, huh? compared with the United States where everything is more or less chemical. You know, we need to go back to that natural and we can do that. You know, the knowledges are still there, not for everything, but so those are just little examples. Um, what I also, this is totally different subject, but it, it is part of, I think, what we need to think and confront is the relationships uh, among major powers. I don't know about little countries, that is sort of, you know, but the major countries. Uh, I thought that China conducted itself in a much more serious and sort of, you know, adult way than Donald Trump, 
who kept saying the China virus, you know, sort of to let them get in. Eventually Trump came around a bit, right? But we can't have political classes that are as stupid and as childish as this president. And I'm hoping that one issue, at least within the United States, that one issue that comes out of this is that it really matters who are our political classes. And for me, another thing is we need, I've long argued this, we need particular knowledges need to be present in whatever are the political classes, you know, uh, even if that, that means changing some of these notions that anybody can run, et cetera. We, yeah, anybody can run, but we also need expertise and the range of expertises that we will need is just expanding enormously. And I think that, that, um, that this current crisis has touched on that a bit too, you know. We have too many in the political classes who after all have voice and have, huh? we're just too ignorant. They're just really, they know very little. And, and that is not possible. So I, but that's just one level. Huh? The people's level is in my reading, in a way, the far more significant one, the one that can make the difference, one that can, you know, uh, uh, innovate. And we have had that across, you know, century. We have, there always have been some individuals who were creative, innovative, etc. But something is not working out now and probably it never did very well in the past either. And, and that is how can we, how can we collaborate in the sense that different types of knowledge that we secure, let's say every city or every neighborhood, neighborhood is maybe too small, but let's say city, but not just country, has a whole range of forms of knowledge that partly come from other parts of the world, you know, because they do it better there or because they have traditions that we have lost. I mean, I think that the knowledge function and I mean it not as in inventing how do we get to the moon. Huh? I mean it just in terms of questions of daily life, questions that affect us all sooner or later. I do think that that should be part of the story. The fact that so many people died the first few days that this virus emerged was also a function of a lack of recognition of the power of an invisible something in a context where we think, well, we have the most advanced medical uh, knowledges, et cetera, right? We in the West, especially. Uh, and hey, you know what? We were missing a big, uh, 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 well, maybe not big, but quite a piece of the story. Yeah? And so those are also the things that I, I, want, I want to see a discourse, you know, and emerging from many, many different voices about these pieces of reality that, that that have come up, realities that were there, but that we didn't see. And when I say we, I mean we, the privileged we in big cities, we in fairly advanced countries. I'm not talking about uh, uh, more, more traditional settings, the Amazonas or... Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's how I see it as well. I mean, I, I've been following it since mid-January and then when, 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 when you follow it closely, I mean, now this ability is spread. Everyone is following it. Uh, and uh, uh, what it gives you is this kind of uh, comparative uh, possibility, possibility of comparative analysis. So you are stuck in one country and you can see what the other country is doing or is not doing, how the healthcare system is uh, uh, affected or not. Or I can even see it on very little things, as you say, you know, when I go to my local supermarket here in Vienna, there are no restrictions on getting in into the supermarket. So basically the supermarket here is like a disco club, you know, it's, it's a socializing place where, I mean, I get anxiety to go in because it can be 50 people in the supermarket. While I hear from my parents in Zagreb, for instance, there is a limit that I don't know, maybe just five people at the same time can be inside. And now when people share this kind of information, they see how incompetent or competent a certain national government is. Like, uh, uh, I mean, the same is happening today yeah. in the UK with Boris Johnson who just tested positive. Yeah. And we all remember him 
on this video saying, oh, nothing will happen. I just was in the hospital and so on. Uh, so, and I think this goes for so many levels of society, uh, 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 which are now kind of being demasked, unmasked. Exactly, but, exactly. Yeah. It's an invitation for us to rethink a few things, to recognize, to, to hear, to listen, to pay attention, to want to discuss with others. Uh, it, it is, it has that quality, I think, because it is, because it is so invisible and so powerful. You know, it just doesn't fit. Think of our big movies, you know. There is no such thing as invisible and very powerful. <laughs> yeah, there, there are more, more questions which are connected. I, I'm getting them now, plenty yeah. of them. Uh, uh, one is uh, about uh, the future of democracy. So how does uh, coronavirus impact democracy? And one question which is connected to it is, uh, what will be the possible ways or means of the subaltern and the excluded people to mobilize across the world against capitalism? So on the one hand, what is the future of democracy? And also in this situation of confinement, social distancing, what will be the ways, not so much us, I think we are the privileged, but all those people who, be, who live in the slums and who will be affected the most, refugees, excluded, subaltern to react against capitalism. So starting with that first one, I think that when, when, when I, well, India, you know, with its so many poor people, so such a rich and intelligent and large elite who doesn't care at all. You know, I am really a critic of how, uh, how, how more, more of India than of say China or something like that. So I think it, it really, um, I think something has to change, uh, number one. Number two, we have to go transversal. We cannot simply stay with our knowledge silos, which are often brilliant and we're often super right and I don't know what all, but it just won't work. And this invisible transversal virus, which cuts across the whole world, is one little signal. And Third element, question we need to ask ourselves, what's next? We didn't know this existed. We have to ask ourselves, what's next? And so that means also re reorganizing how we deal with mother nature, frankly, you know, or with nature. So that is, I don't want to be too length because you said there are some other questions. So let me. There is one question which is uh, direct and connected to, to your work and numerous books. Uh, uh, which is uh, a question uh, about the private and the public spaces. Uh, so the question is, private places are becoming public as people stay at home to work and communicate. And can this phenomenon reverse the privatization of what is public? Uh, that is a very nice one. I think that would take a bit of decoding. <laughs> but I think that... Uh... I, I hope it could, you know, that it would make that kind of difference because we, we know moreover when it comes to so-called public space, we know that, uh, that many, much of what it presents itself as public space is actually private space. Uh, it just looks public because you can go and sit there. But if they decide that they don't want that anymore, uh, then, you know, you're out. So, so there is something about the lack of transparency in so many of our situations in this modernity of ours. I don't know that it always was that way or that it will always be that way, but this modernity that we have is marked by representations that are often illusions. They're not real. The reality is far more brutal than those representations. And, and this little virus brought us down to earth again. Huh? This was little, uh, this, this was quite significant that any piece of food matters, that your neighbor matters, that, you know, this is sort of an interesting moment in that sense. I mean, we scholars, you know, we can immediately construct a whole thing about an event like this, but so I, I don't want to exaggerate here, but there is something about the nature of this, uh, of what has happened the invisibility, 
It doesn't have the biggest cannons, you know? That, it, it's an invitation to think. It really is an invitation to think. Mm. At the same time, precisely because it's invisible, it also creates all sorts of reactions, uh, which sometimes uh, uh, open the fear, uh, not among uh, the theoreticians, but also ordinary people, that uh, we will get rid of many civil liberties, that we might end up in a sort of normalization of the state of exception, uh, uh, even if it is necessary to be careful at the moment and have, and have restriction of mobility, uh, a question on everyone's lips is what if the wet dreams of the populist leaders such as Orban and so on actually come true and then after this crisis is somehow solved or the tiny organism decides to leave or to live with us without killing us, uh, what do these measures stay? Uh, so there is a question uh, 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 which is connected to this from the audience, which asks the following. Uh, the powers to be have the means to force us back to business as usual and even worse. In France, that is happening. Saving the economy seems to mean working people will be like in a gulag. How to stop it? Yeah. No, this is serious. And also the United States, of course, is also going that way. Huh? The, the big... Uh big uh, owners, corporations, etc., have already, I mean, they have a whole program that they are forcing. And of course, Trump is very open to that. So no, this is the ambiguity huh, that, and we know that every war has generated possibilities for good people and for the baddies, you know, and the baddies in this case are very, very powerful, very smart, they know what they want and they usually get what they want. So we have to be on full alert and um, I, I do want to, to emphasize once again, though, that the, the virus has also generalized something. So out of that, besides the arrogance of those with power, um, there is also the fact that I want the powerless to, to experience this as an opening you know, as something that, aha, uh -huh, because after all, many of the rich also died. They were affected, etc. So I want, I want this to, to, to convey that, aha, uh -huh, it's a spectrum, there are openings, it doesn't all belong to them. You know, that, that sense of, now I don't know that the poor and hungry in the slums of India will have even a second of time to think about these things. But I am not poor in the slums of India. I have time and I should be thinking about this. You know, I'm not expecting the, we, what, where we in the West have failed is that we have gone to populations that are truly exploited, etc. We good people, we, we good, you know, and try to help them in quotation marks. It, you know, that is, that is not uh, what I'm talking about at all, huh? I, I, because I think that is a whole more complicated story since we have contributed to making those poverties. Huh? I don't want to talk too much if, because we're running out of time and, and if there is another question or comment. Yes, unfortunately, the, the hour is really passing very quick with you, Saskia. Uh, but uh, so let me pose uh, one last question maybe, uh, which is uh, a kind of uh, almost, uh, self-help question in the sense I think many people are asking themselves what should they do in this situation of self-isolation, those who are happy enough to be in self-isolation to add. Uh, so the question is uh, what good examples of literature or fiction or science fiction do you turn to during a time like this? You, yourself personally. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know it is this no, kind of... No, that's not my, uh, my forte. I mean, there are many people who would have some great suggestions. <laughs> Regrettably, I am sort of closer to the ground, you know. I'm a bit at ground level. And I, right now, am in a completely different zone from, say, great books that, that you know. On the contrary, I want to almost play detective and try to trace, you know, how do we keep whatever was gained in this event because people 
realized even the most powerful can be destroyed by an invisible and the possibility of action the need of action we need we had to get our masks you know from japan and from south korea you know all those kinds of elements i just want I'm very much focused on that. I want to recover that because that tells us our limits, the limits of some of the most powerful countries in the world. And it tells us how we need others who might be very weak. We need the nurses. We need the nice young men and women who are willing to help. We need. And so, so that is a bit my, uh, my sense is this very, very much this current moment rather than you know some, some grand whatever outcome. I don't know about the grand outcome. I know that already in the United States, a lot of the big investors have persuaded Trump that a lot of money has to go to them. You know, that is not what I'm thinking about. All these kinds of facts, you know, I know about them and I think they're disastrous, but I'm trying to imagine other types, other modes of enablement that recognize those other knowledges that often poor people have. On, and, 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 and it's not just about poor people. And this notion of, you know what? There is work to be done, you know, as somebody said, <laughs> the famous phrase, huh? there's work to be done. I think that is what I'm on right now. There's work to be done. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Saskia, uh, for being with us. Uh, I hope you will join us again. Uh, and good luck with your work, which has to be done. Don't, <laughs> don't work too much. Uh, also, try to relax a bit and stay at home as much as you can. It well, was great, fantastic to talk to you again. Oh, it was wonderful. Yes, we stay in touch and say hello to the whatever the others. I will say hello to, to all of them. And let me just announce to, to, to our audience that tomorrow we have uh, another special day. Uh, uh, I'm joined by the Mexican actor Gael Garcia Bernal yes, and, and it will also show a special recording uh, of a conversation I had with Noam Chomsky this week uh, also okay. giving his perspective. Fantastic, wonderful. And okay. Also if you want to join Saskia you can register a DM I will send you a link uh, and on Sunday Ejet Emel Kuran uh, a great friend and writer is also joining us. So we will continue this series. I think it's really important that we speak. Usually we would meet in Berlin, in Zagreb, somewhere during the good old times uh, <laughs> uh, with Richard as well. Well, also Richard Sennett is our guest uh, next week. Uh, I think some of the topics we covered today uh, are uh, also Richard's topics, you know, the, the fall yeah. of the public man, how does the public and the private change with this invisible little yeah. tiny organism. Uh, but I thank you, Saskia, for the poetry you gave us today. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. I love bye poetry. Bye.